I am so glad people showed up. I was not sure. Did not want to be lonely. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to be in conversation with Michael on his book birthday, the day after your book birthday. Um, and he's actually going to start off this conversation by doing a reading for yes. us from the text. It's just going to be like a ski taste, because um, I can barely say words this week, so bear with me. <laughs> um, if you're reading for the deeper shit, that's not going to happen. So I'll be reading briefly from <laughs> Learning How to Hoe and Date and Failing at Both. I assumed he was biracial because despite clearly being of Asian descent, he had braids and wore a grill and his name was Trevante. <laughs> he didn't necessarily have Jackson 5 nostrils, but they were at least B2K nostrils, so there was a legit reason not to have a definitive answer on his racial makeup. And again, his name was Trevante. Not to be completely stereotypical, but Trevante is the kind of name that screams black. For the record, I'm not a racist working in human resources who sees a name like Javante and promptly deletes the resume over fears that upon being hired, he'll show up carrying a huge tube of Larry's seasoned salt and sprinkle it all around his cubicle to mark his territory as he quietly plans the race war on company time. In fact, I've muled, muled, actually can't get the words out, naming a set of twins I'll create with the help of science named Destiny's Child and Jodeci. Then again, there are quite a few ba 1990s babies with the name Jodeci, and perhaps I ought to go with another R&B group of that era like Troop of Silk. I remain undecided on that, but to be clear, while I have no problems with names that scream black, 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 I do expect someone named Trevante to at least have one parent of Negro descent. We met at a gay club, black club in Houston called 2020. It was Saturday night, so virtually every black gay man who had, was a club goer would frequent it. Yet another reason to assume Trevante was a racial and ethnic concoction like Tiger Woods. <laughs> I was back in Houston, miserable, and trying to figure out how in the hell I had ended up back in my hometown after spending all that time and money in college trying to live anywhere else but Houston. Going to the club and getting drunk out of my mind was a coping mechanism. I also went because my sex life was non-existent, and that club was a good venue for me to work out some of my sexual frustration. I wasn't having sex, but I did fill up on boys, get filled up myself, and on occasion, exchange numbers with someone who ideally might be someone I could get to know, fall for, and when I felt comfortable, consummate the relationship with. And then we'll just talk now, because more thought shit happens, and <laughs> it's embarrassing. This is your turn. Yeah, thank you for that tease of a reading. Um, can you complete the story for us? Um, it ends up like me sitting in a fire ant bed, um, pissing outside of a Victoria's Secret in a very nice white part of uh, Houston, um, ending up at a motel with his cousin and some other person that I didn't know, um, and having like scars for like three months. <laughs> So the reason I asked um, is because wasn't the original title of your memoir Fire, Fire Ants, Ants and Fornication? And fornication? Yes, um, the it has like three titles, but that was the one I was very passionate about until Jesus stepped in and was like, "Nah, bitch, you got it. It's me." <laughs> when did you know that I can't d date Jesus and therefore Catholicism and finding and losing faith? was going to be the filter through which you wanted to frame the memoir. I forgot the answer, but I can see Clover Hope, um, who reminded me on the Twitter that in 2013, I said, I think I need to call my book, I Can't Date Jesus. Um, so five years ago. Yeah, it's, it's been a very long journey, but I always knew I wanted to write a book. I knew what I wanted to talk about. And in hindsight, it worked out the way it was supposed to because this right. book wouldn't have happened had all those years not gone by, but yes. Um, I knew I had something to want to play with the Lord just because. Was there a specific moment where you started actively writing the book or was it something that was like always kind of ambient in your life? Uh, so when the iconic Helena Andrews wrote Bitch is the New Black, she was very gracious to uh, show me her book proposal to show how it could actually be done because usually some people just don't, we don't tell each other these things. Right. And so I had written probably like four chapters like I just kind of consistently wrote on it on and off for a few years while I was trying to like get an agent and, and figure things out um, only maybe I think the initial book like the first four chapters kind of teeter towards that like what you read none of that is kind of the same 
but the the spirit of each was there. Um, I had to gussy a lot of that shit up. Thankfully, I read more books and got better and older. But yeah, I had a solid amount of material because I actually did not have a lot of time to get the book done. Right. Um, that's no shade to anybody. Um, high Simon and Schuster, High Atria, High 37 <laughs> Inc. But yeah, <laughs> didn't have all the time and I was like freelance writing, which was not going well. So thankfully I had a little bit of a base, but it needed a lot of work. Right, and so I wanted to ask you about freelance writing. Myself and I think many people in this room know you primarily as a cultural critic. I think that people kind of turn to you as the person who dissects, digests things that happen in popular culture. I talk too much, yes. You talk just enough, very well, hilariously. Well, I love you. I'm glad you things. came. Aww. <laughs> um, but I find it really interesting when writers who we know as doing one thing decide to pivot and write in another genre. Um, and what is so interesting about your book is that you do bring that pop culture gaze to it. You know, yeah. you talk about Janet Jackson, you talk about Beyonce, um, reality TV, these, this sort of thing. Was it difficult for you to decide I'm not going to apply critique to phenomena or other people and instead apply it to myself and to my life and to my family? Um, my very cheap form of therapy was applying the skill set that I learned being a culture critic to myself. And I think being able to criticize yourself kind of informed my writing because I wanted to be um, honest about my own shit about this book, like how much you kind of get in your own way. I wanted to be very fair uh, to my parents when writing about them and writing about how we grew up um, and knowing what to say and what not to say, even if I still might get slapped with a Bible soon. Um, and to be, but to be honest, like I kind of fell into writing full time and I really fell into being like a critic. Like I'm very opinionated. Anyone that's ever met me knows that. But I didn't anticipate being a full time writer. Like I, as I mentioned in the book, I thought I'd be Katie Kirk with a dick. Um, and then I realized I was too opinionated to be, at the time, like a news anchor. That's not really the give with me. Um, and so my own insecurities, the economy crumbling, um, media bubbling, you kind of just, I just fell into it. And then I knew that I, I knew that I had to be as opinionated as possible and continue to hammer at that because I, I, I realized like, no, people actually, when I used to blog, um, my blog called The Cynical Ones, I realized that people were really taking to me being a critic and I just kind of fell into it. And when I got the opportunity to like talk about myself and you know create something, it was perfect because I didn't want to have to necessarily, I mean, I, I don't mean this as shade because I, I realized I might have came across when I did that interview um, with Terry Gross. Uh, sorry, I had to stunt real quick. <laughs> I'm a country nigga from Harlem Clark, that is big for me. Um, <laughs> that it was just nice to step away from that. It was really nice to not have to sit there and internalize everybody else's shit, particularly at the rapid pace of the internet. So it's a very long way of saying, um, I have been waiting for this moment for a very long time. So when I got to do it, I applied everything that I had already been using other stuff and other skills that I had to get to use and into this book. Right. Um, I appreciate this memoir for many reasons. And one of them is because you do the personal essay, but you do it correctly. Thank you. Because <laughs> that could have went either way. I mean, <laughs> there was an era, and I mean, some people would argue that it's still going on online in which people were kind of just like paid literally no money to just lay out all their trauma on the page. Um, and it, I think, created a very, I would say, toxic environment in which the point was not to cultivate good writing, yeah. but just to just get clicks. No oh, are you gonna say something? I have, <laughs> no, it, it can wait. <laughs> Um, but your memoir is steeped in a much older tradition, you know, you read Michael's book and you hear echoes of David Steris, you even hear, I mean, in some of your music criticism, I think about Joan Morgan. Um, so I would love to hear more <laughs> about uh, how you metabolize your literary influences and to building your own voice. I think I'm of the last generation that knew what um, working in media and print looked like, where you didn't have to write at such a high volume, where criticism didn't have to come in 24 hours or like six hours, mm -hmm. depending. Um, so knowing that and being able to like read people like Kieran Mayo, Dream Hampton, uh, Joan Morgan, Kevin Powell, that really informed the way I wanted to write um, again, I didn't necessarily want a full-time writer, but I knew I wanted to write at some capacity. Um, and the thing about the personal essay, particularly the way people get exploited, is that I already knew that, particularly in terms of otherness, like, 
people love to hear, oh my God, it's so awful to be you. And it would be very easy for me to be like, oh my God, you gay, you black, you country, you grew up Catholic, shit, don't nobody like you. Um, tell me more, cry, bleed on the page for like $3. Um, and I will say what actually helped me get over the hump to get representation and a book deal eventually was I wrote something for XO Jane about being, uh, finally tackling my issues with sex and intimacy. Um, more so just intimacy, not necessarily um, sex in that context, but it did not pay a lot, but I knew if I, because of the placement, I knew, basically I knew white women would read it. I knew the reality is when you write for black media sometimes, it's not validating the same way. Mm -hmm. So while I, it, to be honest, while I knew I was gonna be taking a loss financially, I knew it would pay um, in other dividends, and it did in that it got me on Michelle Martin's show, it got me more work, it impressed people. Um, but I feel bad for a lot of the writers because even, I'm not, I don't say this arrogantly, but I'm self-aware. Uh, I can be just as critical of myself as I am of other people mm -hmm. in projects. Um, I don't think most writers, younger writers in particular are not, and not to be ages, I just think one reason why I was able to kind of be better at it is that I studied my parents and was trying to figure out the fucked up shit that in my, um, I hope I'm not cussing too much, but, in my home, so I kind of really applied that too to like how I looked at myself and how I wanted to write it. Um, I think this is I'm uh, hoping I, I, this is a shady part. I'm just sorry, there are books out now that like, what were you thinking? <laughs> With all due respect, like, and you got set up. And for the rest of your life, people are always going to reference that. It's all, it literally people are going to hit you with it. And thank God, honestly, that I did not get a book to the 25 or 26, or at least I, if I did, I would have had a, an editor that really looked out for me. I'm very grateful to my editor that he had already trusted my vision and he knew that I knew myself and there were notes in the, in, when the editing process that like actually made the story better. Right. But if I had been left to fend to myself with some kind of clueless, Person and to be honest, some of the references he didn't get, but I'm like, trust me, they'll understand. And if they don't, they can Google the shit when I have to read like stuff that I don't know. Um, but I feel bad for the others who um, continue to be exploited because you basically get paid not a lot of money to embarrass yourself, or if you're paid a lot, you're yeah, you're like you're left out to fester. Like that's gonna be there forever. Mm -hmm. I was very particular about what I wanted to put. I really wanted this to be something simply to make people laugh and make people think, but also didn't want to embarrass myself. Or if I'm embarrassing myself, it's within, an, like I'm cognizant of what the hell I'm saying in the book. Okay, let me stop being shady. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're having a conversation about exploitation, which I think is, it undergirds all writing, right? Whenever you decide to speak for another person or interpret their lives or translate their experiences, there is that kind of like murky gray area. Yeah. Um, in which you privilege your perspective over their, their own. It's just like impossible to, I think, uh, come over. But with personal essay writing in which you write so much about your family, you write so much about growing up in Houston, you write so much about uh, your conflicts with your mother and your father, mm -hmm. um, I think it, it enters a more difficult, higher register. Um, did, were you nervous about getting your parents wrong on the page or getting your family you know, in such a way that maybe was not as proximal to your actual experience of growing up? Um, I wasn't until I realized I almost made the mistake of how I talked about my father in the book. Um, while writing the book, that my, my dad's chapter was kind of already done. I had already made up my mind. Um, I was still forgiving, but um, there was a specific context that I didn't have that my sister literally didn't tell me until I was writing about it, because she's the only person I've really been able to talk to about what I'm talking about in the book and what mm. th the aim was, and I know this is gonna be maybe an issue for some people, but I felt it was necessary and why. Um, and she told me that something particularly about how my dad related to my Uncle Daniel, who he was about to write about how him, him dying. I didn't have the context of how close they were before that happened and how my dad was speaking in anger and hurt. And as soon as she explained that, it made sense because I'm like, Ugh, that is how he acts, isn't it? Um, and so it, it, even if it was just like a little, no, I was like, oh shit, I really have to go back and, because again, I had made peace with a lot of things that happened, but I think even in that, because it made me realize, like to be honest, if I you know, brought 
someone home, if I had to choose which parent um, would be more inclined to meet him, it would be my pops, who, I I I to paint a picture, again, he, I love him. He wears his hair in plaits, or braid, um, with the gold fronts. He was a mechanic. He will definitely stab you for me. Um, <laughs> Uh, when he found out I was going to Howard, he was like, you need a piece, I'll get you a piece. I was like, Pops, <laughs> it's after 9-11, you can't sneak a gun into <laughs> luggage. Um, but to, in his defense, all he knew was Washington, D.C., and I got jacked at gunpoint in D.C., and my response to that was like, I could've got Rob hit home for free. Um, <laughs> so, it's like, I, but you know, I, always knew my, I always knew my dad's um, place of hurt. Mm -hmm. um, but I was less forgiving for a long time. And in writing the book, I will say that actually made me cry while writing it, because I had to talk about some very dark things I wasn't sure if I was going to admit on paper, but I'm glad I did. Um, but I also wanted to get my mom right, because as much as I love my mom, we have very um, creative differences about our interpretation of many things, particularly like the, the gay thing. Um, that was problematic. I'm joking. Don't, don't put that on Instagram. Like, <laughs> <laughs> No. Um, I wanted to get her right, even though I know she probably will still not approve. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be more forgiving than I think that, in some respects, she's been to me. Not that I actually need forgiveness, which is ultimately the problem. But I wanted to be fair to my parents, and I felt like they were fair to me, and that's something I just really hope to nail down. And I think, to the best of my abilities, I did. So this book, not only is it a personal memoir, it also entails financial writing, some of which yeah you expanded on in the New York Times uh, at the end of last year. Mm -hmm. There's also religious writing. Like I keep saying that a Catholic magazine should absolutely publish parts of it because I think that you talk about faith and the loss and the lapse of it in a really like visceral way as a lapsed Catholic. If a Catholic I magazine identify. published something from my book, I will, <laughs> although I will say yesterday, after I did Bevy Smith's show, she grabbed my book and she gave it to a priest that has a show across the hall. He looked at the what title priest and has laughed. A show across the hall from it was Bevy Father Smith. something. He was kind of lit because he started look at the title. He started laughing. I was like, um, <laughs> let me tell you now, Father, like, don't read certain chapters. Like, <laughs> don't, because he was like, but I can date Jesus, and then he put up a ring. So he had a sense of humor. Ooh, that's but I don't think most um, <laughs> Catholic <laughs> clergymen have humor. Yeah, uh, I I ignored it. I was like. I'm already going we to hell with this title. We can talk about Jesus as the bride yes. of Christ for like a whole other hour. We could. We're going to get into it. Uh, I, no, I'm, I'm still tripping about the priest. That would be <laughs> What was the question? I'm sorry. Um, I think I actually didn't even complete the question, but I wanted to ask, um, when you do that kind of writing, which is writing that we're not used to hearing, right? Like people are very like sheepish talking about money. Yeah. They don't really talk about religion in frank ways. Do you get nervous about having to represent, you know, the counter or to be antagonistic to these traditions that, you know, are up upheld in certain ways in certain communities? Like, do you feel a type of way about exposing what we don't want exposed? I put no thought into that because I think if I did, it would have gotten the way of my writing and what I wanted to say. So I just tried to literally just write how I felt or how I have used to feel and just stick to that and not think about that. Because if I put too much thought into that, then I'll put much thought into what my family would think, then I'll put much thought into like people I'm writing about, then ultimately that would have fucked it up. And it might have only been three people here, so no. I, I tried to ignore it. And to your question about the financial writing, um, the thing I wrote in the New York Times uh, was very difficult to, for me to write, and it was honestly embarrassing. Can uh, you tell us a little bit? So um, for the Sunday Review, I wrote an essay about my um, plight with private student loans and essentially kind of um, what is, what's, it, what's it like to do everything that you were told was like quintessentially the right thing and then that system not really being there to support you and like working in basically a, a dying I industry and the challenges with kind of like tackling like this insurmount what often feels like insurmountable debt and you know, um, Try not to default, which I have not, uh, but it took a lot of sacrifice and I have definitely struggled with the reward part. I think that's finally coming, but um, it should not It should never have been this difficult. Uh, and so to write about that and to admit that, my place in life, having a book deal, being of a certain age, um, it didn't feel great. But 
I, d I realized like talking about it really resonated with a lot of people in the same way that talking about faith and sex and intimacy has resonated with people. I think, um, I know that uh, I just don't want to be pedestrian, and I don't really mean that anyway, but I want to actually have something to say. I want to actually change the conversation. Not necessarily pretend that I'm inventing something, but like at least offering my perspective that I often feel is missing. And so that essay probably w w is actually the basis of kind of the next book, um, which will probably be more difficult to write than this one because that's, I'm very ambitious. Uh, I have a lot of goals. Uh, been a lot of false starts and things again that should not have happened and so I really struggle with that it's, it's, it actually almost spoiled this moment because everyone has been literally telling me have you taken in the moment and I didn't really think about anything until Monday okay. and then yesterday because I'm always just like go 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 and I'm usually emailing my agent obnoxiously even though I need to turn in the post I was like we better get more money for this shit next time like I'm sick of this so <laughs> hi agent <laughs> Which, in hindsight, is ridiculously silly because of doing this. Um, but yeah, it wasn't easy writing. That was actually probably harder to write than the book. And I know that yeah. writing more about that will be challenging. Right. Uh, I like to ask writers this. What did you leave out of the book? Um, I won't there's say a, like a lot in it. So. I won't say explicitly what it was, but I will say I left out the exact type of mocking and insults that my dad would do at my mom. Mm -hmm. It was not my place to say certain things. And I think in that instance, I said enough. Um, and I tried to be, again, I, 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 I realized the challenge is ahead in some respects, but um, there were things I left out purposely because I felt like it wasn't my place to say. Mm -hmm. um, and even with my brother and my sister, I literally like asked my, I was like to my brother, like, do you mind if I say that you're gay? He's like, no, nah, I don't care. Um, and he actually wishes, apparently, that he, I included him more so he could get a cut. Um, <laughs> I got that message yesterday. You know him. He, he meant that. Um, <laughs> it's like, get the hell off my phone, Marcus. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like things like my, the names, I didn't really focus on my sister. I made like, a note about her divorce, but like, I, I, left my f I tried to leave my family out as much as possible because like, they didn't ask for this. This is my shit. And that's a note I actually took from like, Janet Mock about that. She's like, okay. You want to tell the story as you're telling yours, but you don't want to bring people into this because they didn't ask for it. Right. Um, you have such a like tactical, tangible way of talking about writing that I really admire. Like you just talk about the actual thing as opposed to like abstractions and all this stuff, um, which I will use as a segue to talk about intimacy and sex and lovers. Um, you know. This is the part where people yell, "You a thought? <laughs> it's coming." <laughs> I see two people about to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you can let it out now. No? Okay. No, they just made faces. <laughs> ah. um, but because this book tracks your young adulthood mm -hmm. and your like self-actualization, you're like finding your sexuality, you write about intimacy like <laughs> in a way that almost made me kind of like nervous or anxious at some moments because you're so clearly saying that, you know, you have struggles with it. Um, there are times where you talk about like meeting up with a guy and like not feeling it in the moment. And um, it's something that I relate to, but like have been afraid to articulate articulate for my own self. Um, and I would just like to know where does the writing stop and like the therapy or like the, you know, um, reckoning with your own personal issues regarding intimacy start? Um, I think, um, the, the, ch the chapters, at least for me specifically, where I kind of really tackled how ridiculous I had been this whole time was when I was dating someone that was positive. Or, and even before met someone that was positive. And then when you meet somebody, it, this is very early Mariah Carey ballad, but you meet someone, your, your mind does change. You do kind of realize, it, sometimes it does just take one person to make you be like, you're being an idiot. Um, and I already knew I was being ridiculous, but then I actually met somebody and had a connection. I'm like, oh, okay. I, I really, that doesn't matter. And then during that time, I had already been trying to tackle it on my own, but I kind of, I really do tend to just keep going. And I sometimes I just, it sounds maybe oversimplified, but I literally just sometimes have a moment where I just hit a wall and like sit down and be like, you need to think. Mm -hmm. 
I'm very like, and to your point about like the writing, I'm just like, that's work, and you need to get this shit done. Um, and I look at like life a lot, a lot of times about like that. Uh, so, yeah, like when I met someone that made me challenge, then I met someone else who's positive that made me challenge, and then I'm like, this is going to be a thing. This is going to happen. This is a real reality. What are you going to do about it? And are you finally going to kind of like tackle what's been bothering you? And uh, to be fair, I had already been making progress. Um, it became a better thought, and then that happen. Hope I answered that correctly. I'll ask another follow-up question. Did you talk to any of the men that you write about in the book after the writing to sort of like get their perspective on what uh, your relationships were, however fleeting I or however long? I talked to one of them specifically. He ain't like it. I'm fine. <laughs> um, I, it was one of those, like, I didn't want to get anybody wrong, but when we had a conversation, it was difficult just because it was like, you were actually more part of this process than anyone else was. And so uh, while I want to be respectful of like maybe I, I really wanted to, I challenged myself to be like, did I get this wrong? I thought I communicated this, mm. but then I went back like, no, I literally look back at old messages and emails. I like really thought I'm like, no, I told you exactly what was gonna happen. You literally chose your alias. Um, what did you think was going to happen based on when have you ever known me not to mean what I say? Um, so that's one person I talked to. It didn't end well. I don't really give a fuck, to be honest, at this point. Like, I, I, I felt bad for, like, a little bit. Then I thought, I was like, whatever. I told you. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, so <laughs> I've read this book many times over the course of, like, maybe eight months or something. Um, and in my reading, I had one framing. I was like, okay, this is Michael's story. But then in media, it, you know, uh, attracts another framing, which is, this is a coming of age gay memoir about losing your faith. You know, all yeah. of these like big things get invoked. Do you feel pressure or anxiety um, or do you welcome that, uh, I would say, mantle of you necessarily writing one of the, as compared to other memoirs, one of right. the few coming of age gay memoirs that we have? Um, I knew that uh, I, no, I'm gonna be honest. Okay, so I actually don't care because I knew that would happen anyway. For me, I just needed to get a fucking book deal. I had already been dealing with people who were like, you're very niche, who in so many words would be like, you're black and gay, therefore you can't appeal to anybody else. Mm -hmm. People are gonna package it however the hell they wanna package it. I just needed the opportunity um, to show what I can do. And I knew that if I, despite being gay and black, whatever, I knew good writing is good writing and that people would actually see the bigger themes. Mm -hmm. And so for the most part, I w at least from my perspective, um, don't let me know if I got it wrong. Um, I think most people got what I was trying to do in terms of the media coverage. I think they lead with the identity because whatever, but I think ultimately people really understood that it, I, those two things did not mean you can't relate to that. You know, it, it, like I love David Sedaris, we're nothing alike. Right. We're nothing alike, and I can, s I can see myself in anything. Sometimes I don't really need to see myself. I could just appreciate a good story for what it is. So thankfully, you know, I, I, I will say I did know when, like, a very nice um, white woman tagged me on Instagram. She was knitting a sweater while reading my book, <laughs> and she had the sweater next to my book, and she was like, I loved it so much. I didn't know all of the references, but I looked it up a little bit, and I was like, yes, girl, you did what I have to do when I read white people. Like, it's fine. <laughs> uh, and actually, today, my best friend Andre sent me a video of a very nice woman, um, evangelical. She's like, she was like, it was like a, a call to arms in her YouTube. She was like, oh my God, I want people to really read this. I feel like people are not seeing this enough um, because I saw so much of myself despite, I wrote the book, I knew people are getting it. You know, like, again, like, I, 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 Terry Girls talked to me. People are getting it. <laughs> Like, and that was, but the thing was, was so frustrating is that people were basically saying, you're cute, but I don't want to fuck, in terms of like the proposal. But like, it's so great, I really like it, but I can't sell it, no one will buy it. <laughs> like, what do you mean? <laughs> this is easy, like, I'm the Cardi B of lit, what the fuck, like, it is done, I hit my teeth. So like, so no, actually, um, yeah, I'm actually very, f I'm fine, I, people are really getting it. I've been in every little pocket the same way I freelance, like, I already wrote for, uh, mainstream sites, black sites, men's sites, women's sites, I already knew my voice could be in all these different spaces, just other people are finally catching up. Ideally, they're still buying. But yeah, I feel vindicated in some respect already. 
I've actually, that's the first time I said that out loud, but yes, I feel vindicated. Yeah. You mentioned this evangelical woman in Houston, which makes me think that we need to talk about Houston a little bit. Yes. Besides Beyonce. No, go. You are the most famous Houstonian. Um, in the essay where you talk about Beyonce, which I really love for a specific reason, you talk about how you recognize that she was pro-black, that mm -hmm. she was feminist back in the Destiny's Child yes. days. Um, and there's been this like revisionist narrative that has uh, been written in the past 10 years, which says that, you know, single ladies begins that era for Beyonce. And you actually have <laughs> the history and the knowledge and an encounter with her, however brief. She I hugged me and I became a better man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's just a, it's a very strong example of how you like embrace the fact that people experience joy and also like knowledge of the self through someone like Beyonce mm -hmm. or through comparable cultural figures. Um, do you think that there are figures right now who are a bit younger who you think might have that same sort of power or are we in a drought? <laughs> I should have consulted with my niece before. I <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Uh, am I old? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, for me, it's Beyonce. Like I, I, I I try to, Megan the Stallion, oh, you mean if you Houstonian, Megan the Stallion. Uh, she is a rapper who also is um, a senior at Prairie View A&M University. Um, it's rumored that she's gonna work with. She's like Beyonce you know, if she sure, leaned into yeah. her rap dreams. I really do like people from Houston um, who are very much Houston, or at least the Houston that I remember, because mm -hmm. usually when I meet people outside of Houston who say they're from Houston, I was like, I don't know where you're from, but. Good luck. Um, I like Megan Thee Stallion. Uh, no one else I can think of. I'm old. I'm, I'm leaning into my 30s. So you live in Houston in this book. You live in L.A. Yes. And you live in New York. Which one would you choose? <laughs> it's not Houston. <laughs> I love Houston, but I'm going back there. Um, it's too hot. Um, I think I fit better. Person, my personality fits better in New York. I've recently discovered I would not mind to be back in Los Angeles, depending. Um, I miss driving. Um, I've embraced weed. Um, I've been to dispensary. I'm, I'm delivered. Uh, <laughs> I'm not like a hiker, but shit, I could go run outside. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm into it now. Uh, I think I want an easier life. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see, but I still very much love Harlem. I love being in New York my family, like the friends that have become my family, they live here, so I'm fine here. I probably need more space, but I'm good. But if I can go back to driving, cause I'm like, there's nothing like blasting UGK in like a white neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> you can do I, that here too though. No, it's not the same. Like I want to like yell wood will lyrics like when my car is down. Like I can't do that shit here. It's like car and like sidewalk bopping. It's not the same and I like, miss, I miss, there are certain things that to me, Houston is, they're similar to LA. It's spread out, you drive, people are nuts, pretty. Like, I, I'm more <laughs> familiar. I miss LA, Ugh. Um, So before we turn it to the audience for questions, I wanna thank you for having me thank talk. Thank you. I <laughs> feel about your book. fancy as Doreen St. Felix, oh who God. is so brilliant, Relax. like 12 years old. I'm a stand, you're gonna let me stand. <laughs> Agree to do this, give her a round of applause. <laughs> Why'd you do that? I'm a stan, I told you. Thank you. Um, how do you want people to read this book? How do you, what do you want people to leave the book with? I'm not really, uh, I try not to tell people too much what to do. Um, uh, for me, my purpose whenever I do something is to make people laugh and make people think. And if I have done that, then I feel like I've actually achieved something. Um, I will say with anyone who's ever, who's ever struggled with, um, trying to reconcile who they really are versus who they were taught to be. I hope the book will speak to them even if it's not their exact struggle, they'll see that part of themselves. And uh, honestly, I wrote a book that I wish I had when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I've done that and I'm proud of that. And yeah. that's all I want from the reader. Everything else, if they take it, you know, hopefully they get what I'm putting down. Amazing, thank, thank you so you. much, Michael. Thank y'all.
We have time for a few questions from the audience. If anyone has any burning queries. Ah, we have one back here. Thanks. Uh, my name is Moses. Um, do you black gay men contribute to black feminism? And if so, have you? I didn't expect that. Um, I think if anyone is feminist or at least identifies with feminist ideals, then they make their contributions their own way. Um, I write very passionately about black women, particularly against men who I think contribute to abuse of black women, and that can come in many forms. I, a lot of my work particularly has been for black women-centered uh, sites, and you know, I've been trashing R. Kelly for a decade. I don't like pissy. Um, I've written about multiple people who say dumb things. I think I do my part in my work. Um, if anyone wants to correct me, I'm sure they'll send me a text later, but I think I make a contribution. I think anyone can make a contribution. I guess the black gay men part isn't a, a longer answer, but I think I've done my part, and I think anyone who identifies again has done theirs. Hi, Michael. I love you. You're like a cousin in my head. Hey, cousin folk. Hey. With the success uh, in the revolution of television and um, black queers, uh, folks telling their stories with uh, Lena um, Waste, Master of None, Thanksgiving episode, and the smash of Pose, do you can do you see your story being featured on the the big screen anytime yes, soon? Yes, the hell I do. Um, more so the small, but yes. No, um, that is something I actively am trying to pursue, and there are some people who agree. You know, that world is very tricky and whatever, but um, lift me in prayer. Pray to Beyonce, light a few candles. Um, some few conversations will be had at the end of the week, and we will see how this book goes and where it takes me. But I would really like to create something with this book, because I, you know, I've been saying, and, I, and again, I don't mean it as like a, a diss, but I would like to create culture, not just simply critique it. I think cr criticism is a gorgeous art, but again, it's something I fell into, and for me, I've always wanted to create something, and I think it's about time that I get that opportunity to do so, and hopefully, this will happen. Yeah. Yay. Hey. Hey, boo, hey. Um, so my question is about um, the, the, uh, the, the evolution of recognizing and rejecting white fragility. Um, and I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are about that because there's so much resistance and pushback to this idea of whiteness being the dominant thing or, you know, being something that we should all sort of genuflect toward. Right. And I think that people who are black creatives or creatives of color or people who have been all typically seen as other um, are finally like, yes, and bold with that in ways that um, are refreshing. Can you talk a little bit about that and your role in that. Can I answer this first? Go. Um, Michael has this really amazing chapter in the book, which I know just came out yesterday, but when you read it, you'll see it's, called, it's in the pink print, right? Yes. Where he, I think, advances a manifesto that is sorely needed in which he says explicitly that he's not centering whiteness in his deconstruction of self and also of culture. And I think that that's something that I've noticed, like the media economy encourages people to kind of say like, what is this black thing in relation to the dominant white center? Um, and it was just so refreshing to have a very clear articulation of, I'm not like, you're not sub or unconsciously doing it, you're making a choice to, to say, I have experienced life in this way, so I'm not going to put on this um, mask of her. experiencing it that way. So no, read the pink print, it's, yes. a, it's a great um, I have nothing to add, but yes. <laughs> But the, I will say that it literally begins with I don't care about white people like that. And it's not necessarily talking about white people individually, but this idea that I'm supposed to center whiteness and care that much, I do not give a, a damn. See, I'm trying to tone down my language, but yes, I don't care. <laughs> Thank you, Doreen. Hi, Michael. Hey. I love your advice column, Dearly Beloved. Thank you. What would you say is the, ad the advice that you've given that you felt you needed the most when you were growing up and maturing? probably cuss myself out and end with chill. Um, but I think I'm extremely hard on myself. It is to the point of sometimes self-sabotaging. Uh, I would tell my younger self, like honestly, just 
be easier on yourself. It'll be okay. You know more than what you think. You just need to try and like actually really believe in it and follow through. And I think that's what tripped me up for a long time, just not having the follow through. We got time for two or three more questions. We got one in the front. Hey, Michael. Hey. Um, so just a question. So um, when you're critiquing articles, often you you will deal in fact, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, in this book, you're going through your life in fact. But you're also, in the book, more in control, I think, of how, pe how people feel, right? When you're telling these stories um, in a way that's different when you're you know, writing about somebody else's art, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, were there any, mo or any chapters in the book or any stories that you kind of took extra care with with the, uh, the audience or the reader in mind, how they were swept away or how they were brought into your psyche. Um, what was one of those, those um, stories? The chapters about my parents, I think I was the most careful about writing about, uh, just because I wanted to be honest but not seem like I was attacking them. Um, but I wanted to, again, be really understanding of where they, like even with my mom, I was trying to be very sensitive to the fact that like I understand why she moves this way and why she thinks this way and how important her interpretation in to her faith is to her. And I think as what I explained is like I think she doesn't understand her the religion that has kept her going, kept her so strong, makes me not want to live. But I think that could have went another way. I was just kind of like dismissing faith, being like Bill Maher, just dis disavowing Christianity. I think Christianity is very important for a lot of people, but I was trying to explain like my position on it, but also being respectful of like why people act the way that they do. And even with my dad, I wanted to be very um, sensitive to, and again, I know exactly why he is the way that he is. I just, yeah, they were the ones I was the most delicate about because they're my parents and um, I love them. And I just wanted to be honest, but to be respectful because I knew it was gonna be challenging to write about them no matter what. And I'm not still sure what the responses will be, but we'll see. Hi, um, you did something really interesting talking about your parents, is that you actually gave like more rigor to it, um, which is something I feel like a lot of people don't do, even when you think about folks like the president or somebody in the Me Too movement, it's like there's like an understanding that you put in your parents. Like how, how are you planning to use that more rigor in like future writings that you do? Uh, there's no specific, I mean, I guess it just depends. I mean, there wasn't anything really special about like why, how I wrote about my parents, I just, that's just kind of how I am. If you really know me, I actually, again, I'm very opinionated, I believe what I believe, but I really do try to make an effort to understand why people feel the way that they feel and are the way that they are and just try to be respectful of that. Um, and in future, like books or whatever, um, whenever a difficult subject like that comes up, I would just kind of keep that in mind. But yeah, there was no trick. I don't know if I answered the question correctly, but like I just, I have a certain sensitivity and I try to exercise it when necessary and I think, when that moment comes, I'll know it when I'm writing. We have any more questions from the audience? Ah, uh, here we go. Hi, Michael. Congratulations. Thank you. So earlier, you were talking about how, like, over the years, you were kind of like doing different research and reading different books. So when you were kind of ideating the different chapters and the different essays, did you find it difficult to not be influenced by the different stories that you were reading? And also, when it comes to you really staying clear on what you want your story to be and not getting distracted by stories that can come off similar, was there a struggle with you with doing that and staying true to your voice and making sure that that was reflected in the, um, the stories that you told here? Uh, I didn't read a lot of books while writing mine because I just didn't have the time. I needed to be focused on my stuff. The one book I did allow myself to read was Samantha Irby's we are never meeting in real life. I adore her, I'm obsessed with her, I love her writing so much. Uh, I think we're similar in terms of like how would we be maybe stacked in a bookstore, but, uh, and not to be arrogant, but I sound like me, and so I don't really worry about sounding like somebody else. I'm, I'm very specific, and so I didn't worry about that, but also didn't have time to read anybody else's book, so I didn't, that wasn't a factor either way. Hi, um, congrats, thank, thank you for you. being here with us. Um, I have a question specific to voice, mm -hmm. uh, to piggyback on what you were just saying about sounding like yourself. This has more to do with uh, 
any you know journalism that you've done in other uh, publications. Um, have you? Did you find it hard to have to maybe uh, dampen or shape your literary voice in a certain way when you were writing for specific publications, especially with ones that are more mainstream and they have a certain way that they present things or, or not? Dep depending on the outlet, it's, it's always usually a negotiation. Um, you know, uh, when I was younger, maybe I didn't push back as much, but it didn't take long for me to be like, no, this stays. It's fine. They'll get it. Um, some people can be more difficult than others. Um, sometimes even black people who care too much about white people think. Um, but I mean, I don't think I'd switch. I just, you know, there, I just, there are just certain tones. Like if I write, usually if I'm pitching a site, I'm a fan of the site. Or if they reach out to me to write for them, I check out the site to see like if this can actually mesh. And usually if you know it's not gonna work, I'll just peace out and be like, God bless you and maybe I'll take care of you and move on to somewhere else. <laughs> the thing about, there are a lot of headaches about freelancing, but one of the joys is if you were particularly doing as long as I have is that people come to you and they know what they're getting and you can immediately be like, look, this is, you knew what it was. <laughs> so I don't have to, I can, like even in the last two years, there have been instances with a mainstream site, I was like, you knew exactly what the hell I pitched. This was exactly what I pitched it to you. Then it got a little casually racist. Then there was an apology. Um, then I just placed it somewhere else. And then two, a few years later, I got an email. Oh, you were right. Do you want to write something now about the same thing? It's like, OK, beloved, sure. What is the rate? Um, so yeah, I think you learn that on your own. But like for me, I'm very strong-willed and like, no, you know what it is. I can dilute. Like, I don't have to curse. I don't have to like, but I'm not going to pacify people either. I think, it's just, again, it's a negotiation. but. You know what you're getting at this point with me. I've been doing this for a while. It's very clear. I saw one hand in the front. Maybe this can be our last question of the evening. Yes. Uh, how the process of writing about your f uh, family, I mean, we all, as someone told me, all families are crazy. <laughs> and uh, how do you process showing your, your what you write to your family, or do you show? How do you? What is the mechanics of, of, of that? I'm, I'm you mean actually showing them what I wrote? Do you or do you? You mean like giving it to them after it's already done? Yeah. Uh, I actually haven't given it to them, but that's not really by my choice. Um, okay. The last conversation I had with my mom about the book wasn't particularly pleasant, and then I made the choice. I was like, oh, okay, girl, I'm not gonna do this no more with you. Um, so that was it. Then you know, I, I would have been willing to give it to her if I thought it would have yielded a, a productive conversation. It's just like, we'll have a cold war on this issue. And hopefully when I come home, you'll make me some praline. But other than that, if <laughs> we can talk about it if you want to talk about it. If you don't want to talk about it, like, uh, well, I'm not going to keep prodding you. I've been, I'm 34 years old now. Mm -hmm. No. So I really tried to have a conversation, but I gave up. So it's like, if she reads it, we'll have that conversation. I know my auntie's going to read it. They told me they bought it. Um, they saw my pre-order request. Um, <laughs> so, you know, my sister, that's actually probably the only one I'm really interested to see what she thinks. Um, she's already started responding to me. My sister is very, very special to me. Um, she's like a second mother, like a really close friend. So she's the only one I really concern myself with about what she thinks. Um, but with my parents, with my mom in particular, like, I already try, I don't care. Thank you. Because you can't care at, after a certain point. It is what it is. Well, Michael, Doreen, thank you so much for having this thank discussion. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for coming. I really, really appreciate it.